السلام ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We are studying the book بلوغ المرام من أدلة الأحكام which is compiled by إمام ابن حجر الأسقالاني رحمه الله and we are dealing with the chapter Kitab al-Tahara and so far we discussed four chapters under the Bab, under the chapters under the Kitab al-Tahara today insha'Allah ta'ala we will be starting with the new chapter the new Bab wahuwa Ba'bul Mas'hi al Khufain, chapter number 5 that is wiping over the Khuf the socks in this chapter we will be dealing at different issues related to Mas'hu al khufain and this particular issue and this particular ruling of during during uh, doing Mas'h on the khufain it is something which is a rukhas a concession from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاقْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبِينَ If any one of you wants to pray, let him wash his face, let him wash his hands till the mirfaq, that is the elbow, let him wipe over the head and let him wash his feet till the ankles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention about the masah on the khufain in the ayat. Though therefore we understand this particular ruling from the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam ibn al-Mundir rahimahullah, one of the greatest scholars, he says that with the consensus of the scholars, bil ijma' that masah al khufain is allowed. Bil ijma'a. There is no ikhtilaf among the ulama on this matter. There is no there is no khilaf. There is no ikhtilaf among the ulama on this matter. That is mashhu al al khufain. And also Hassan al Basari rahimahullah he says that there are over forty ahadith related to mashhu al al khufain wiping over the socks. And Abdullah bin Mubarak rahimahullah he says there are over 70 riwayat regarding this Masu al khufain and many other scholars have mentioned that there are plenty of riwayat which is related to Masu al khufain with this we understand that this hadith that which, which we are going to read the first hadith under the bab is mutawatir it is mutawatir Tawatur. What is the meaning of Tawatur? Tawatur is exactly which is narrated by a plenty of Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So when Sahaba reaches around 50, 30, 70 and more than that, that will be considered as Mutawatir hadith and there is no ikhtilaf on this matter. We will go on to the first hadith and before that when we say Khufain the word khufin is jam'a min al khuf. Khuf is a thing that covers your ankle. When you wear a socks, that which covers the ankle, that is considered as khuf. Anything that does not cover the ankle will not be considered as khuf. 
we have many socks nowadays for example which are under the ankle that is not hoof so doing masah on those things it is not it's it's not valid it invalidates your wudu okay going on to the hadith number 53 under the bab bab masah al al khuffain wa an mughirah ibn shu'bah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qala kuntu ma'a an nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فتوضع فهويت لأنزع خفيه فقال دعهما فإني أدخلتهما طهارتين فمسح عليهما متفق عليه. This hadith is narrated by مغيرة بن شعبة رضي الله عنه and this this hadith is recorded in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. And what is what is what are the wordings of this hadith? He says. That Mughira bin Shaba radiyallahu an, he was with the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kuntu ma'an nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fatawadda'a and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he performed wudu. He performed ablution. Ma'az, this volume is echoing. Is it echoing? It's fine. I feel it's kind of echoing. Okay. فَتَوَدَّعَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ He performed the wudu فَهَوَيْتُ لِعَنْزَ خُفَّيْهِ And Mughira bin Shu'bah He bent down He went down to remove the socks of Rasulullah اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ So that he can wash his feet Rasulullah اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Told Mughira bin Shu'bah دَعَهُمَا Leave it فَإِنِّي أَدْخَلْتُهُمَا تَحَارَةٍ Really purity in the state of purity with this we understand certain things that there are certain conditions of making mas number one you need to wear the socks on tahara of making wudu once you make wudu then you wear socks then you are allowed to make mas on it if you wear the socks on which is you're not in the state of wudu then you're not allowed to make masah on it and second condition is that the khuf the socks has to be above the ankle above the ankle and also when you wear when you want to make masah you should not make masah on the hadath al-akbar that is the major impurity and we have discussed in our previous classes about major impurity what are the major impurity what is the state of major impurity yes Yes. What makes the exa- absolutely janaba, haid, ihtilam, there is ihtilam, and also nufasa, postnatal bleeding, menstruation, ejaculation of the sperm, and janaba, sexual impurity. If you has to wear the socks in this sexual impurity and you make wudu, it's not allowed. Rather, you have to take baths, then make wudu. Then wear socks. Then you are allowed to make masah. Am I clear? Okay. And also the number four, and also the number four, the condition is there are certain timings for it. Waktun muhaddada. You can't wear the socks and you can't make masah as long as you want. There are certain timings for it. Insha Allah, Taala, all these things we will be dealing in the coming hadith. Yes. We will take the questions at the end if you don't mind, Insha Allah. Yes. Wudu will be there. Yes, yes. Valid, valid. Absolutely valid. Yes. <coughs> this hadith demonstrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore the socks when he was in the state of tahara, and Mughira bin Shabab radiyallahu an he bent down to remove the socks so that he can wash it, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him, "Do not remove it. Verily, I wore it in the state of tahara." I want to make one statement here that we are studying the fiqh. We are studying fiqh, the rules and regulations, legislations. What is haram? What is halal? What is mustahab? What is mustahab? What is mustahab in the qawliya and the faliya? Isn't it? But some of the ulama, rahimahumullah, they bought this ahadith in the bab of aqida. When it comes to fiqh, aqida is nothing to do with fiqh, and fiqh is nothing to do with aqida. But everything is interconnected, as a general. 
But when we are talking about halal and haram and rules and regulations, only the fiqh teaches. Aqeedah talks about La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Aqeedah talks about who Allah is, who our Lord is, his names and attributes. It talks about the conditions of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It talks about whom, what makes a person murtad, what makes a person mu'min, what makes a person Muslim, what makes a, makes a person muhsin, what makes a person kafir. Aqeedah deals with these kind of things. Aqeedah deals with the firaq, the different sects. But the fiqh does not deal with these things, rather it deals with what is halal, what is haram and what are the rules of salah, zakat, hajj, saum, shiyam and all these things. But ulama, they bought this particular ruling of Masfa al Khufain in the Bab of Aqeedah. Why? Do you have any idea? It is because the Shia, Rafida, Isna Ashariya, the Shia, you should be knowing who the Shia are, they do not believe in making mash on the khuf. They say it is haram. They say it is haram. Not only that, they do not wash their feet while making wudu. They do not wash their feet. Rather, they do masah on the feet. On the feet, subhanallah. And we do not consider the Shia among the 73 sects. This thing you have to keep in the mind. The Shia, Ithna Ashariya, are not from the 73 sects. They are kharij. They are out of this 73 sects. But they, what do you say? They say themselves they belong to the Muslims, but they are not. They are out, out of this 73 sects. You keep this number. They are not from the Ahlu Sunnah. They are from outside of it. So this Shia, they do not believe this. SubhanAllah. And they reject that hadith, this hadith, which are related to Khuf, which are narrated by several sahaba radiyallahu anhu with this we also understand that we know the aqidah of shia that they do not believe in the sahaba radiyallahu anhu they say they may make takfir what is takfir they consider most of the sahaba radiyallahu anhu as disbelievers and they do not take this hadith and what is a strange thing is that subhanallah some of the hadiths which are mentioned in this bab and especially talks about mashal al khufain is narrated by whom Ali radiallahu anhu and this is a hujjah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against these people there is always the disbelievers there is always the enemy of enemies of Islam they talk about Islam and Allah will make an example from among themselves among themselves in the sense from the hujjah what they use and the hujjah will be against them and they consider Ali radiallahu anhu as ilah they consider he is an imam infallible and Imam, this Ali radiallahu anh, he talks about mas'al al khufain And we'll be dealing this with those ahadith. Subhanallah. What do you understand? The hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. And we have sent down this dhikr, this Quran and the sunnah. And we will protect it. And this is the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. It is not you and me who protect the religion. It is Allah who protects the religion of Islam. So going on to this hadith talks about various aspects, various things. And we know that once Rasulullah some wore the socks in the state of Tahara. And here you can see the adab, the manners of Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Mughira bin Shu'ba radiallahu anhu, he went down to remove the socks of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This talks about the khidmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Reverence, obedience, the love, muhabba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they used to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than themselves. And this is the iman. Whenever he used to make wudu, they used to go and collect the water and make tabarruk out of it. Whenever he spits, the, before the saliva spits, reaches on the ground, they used to take the saliva and make tabarruk upon them. And this is from the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If they have to hear any command from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they hear and without any doubt in it. And this is the obedience. This is how Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they dealt with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they love him more. With this we understand that, you know, when I read this hadith, I remember my friend 
Sheikh Usama Al Azizi. You should have heard, heard this name, Sheikh Usama Al Azizi, who passed away a month, uh, one and a half month back. The son-in-law of Sheikh Dr. R K Noor Muhammad. He was my batchmate in Mecca when we were studying. We used to meet every day. And I remember when we used to attend the halakat of Wasi- Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas, Hafidahullah, the halakat of uh, Tirmidhi and uh, Ibn Majah and uh, Abu Dawood. I remember that he used to carry the shoes of Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas. And he used to carry under his armpit. And we used to all the way walk towards the doors of Masjid al-Haram and he brings down and he helps Sheikh Wasilla to wear it and I remember every time I've seen him he carries it I've seen for two two and a half years continuously he carries all the time most of the time whenever he is available there in the in, in the halakat he rahimahullah he passed away last two one and a half month before and this is the you know the love on the scholars and Sheikh Wasilla used to make dua saying that may Allah raise your standards, may Allah give you, may Allah have mercy upon you, subhanAllah. And when I heard his, when I heard his demise, when I heard his death, uh, around one and a half months back, I was literally moved because he just got married just two months before he passed away. He got married to the one of our famous mashayikhs, Sheikh Dr. Arkinur. May Allah have mercy upon both of them. So I remember him having reverence on the scholars. You know, you respect scholars, Allah will give you the knowledge. You respect the knowledge, Allah will give you the hikmah of it. You respect this religion of Islam, Allah will give you the fiqh of, fiqh of the religion. It all comes with adab, manners. With this we understand, we need to respect each other. That's very important. You, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no manners. Do you think somebody will love you? Do you think somebody, somebody will accept you? Hadith or advice? No, they will not. We all are bad. Nobody are good. But we have to inculcate the manners. As I always say, the manners are not inherited, but it is learned. So learn the manners, inshallah. Going on to the hadith number 54. And this hadith number 54 is a part of the hadith number 1. وَلِلْ عَرْبَعَةِ أَنْهُ إِنَّ إِلَّا النَّسَائِيَّ أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مسح على الخف وأسفله وفي إسناده ضعف this particular hadith is also narrated by Mughira bin Shu'ba radiyallahu an and this hadith is mentioned in Arba'a when we say Arba'a what are those Arba'a? Four Sunan Tirmidhi Nasa'i Ibn Majah Abu Dawood Tirmidhi it is not Sunan but it is Jami' the others are Sunan but we as a, as a whole we say Arba'a this particular hadith which is mentioned in the, all these the books which is Da'if Bil Isnad Da'if Bil Isnad and why it is Da'if because the hadith says Anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam masa masaha ala al-khufi wa asfalaha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did masah on the khuf and also under the khuf that is on the feet and also under the feet this is Da'if this is weak the ulama they say in the in the books of the hadith in the books of the fiqh like Zad al-Mustaqni, Raud al-Murbi and things like that the other books they mention about this particular matter they say if somebody has to do that it does not invalidate the masah rather it is disliked rather it is disliked so what is sahih the next hadith explains that the hadith number 55 and subhanallah this hadith is narrated by whom Ali radiallahu an whom the Shia considered Imam and the Imam of Shia he explains about the masah on the khuf this is hujja against them the hujja against the shia subhanallah wa an ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal law kana ad-din bi ra'yi lakana asfal al-khuf a'la bil mashi min al-'ala awla min al-awla bil mashi min al-'ala wa qad ra'aytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yamsahu ala dahiri khuffayhi akhrajahu abu da'ud bi isnad hasan this hadith is narrated by Ali radiallahu an. And this hadith is narrated in Abu Dawood. It is narrated in Abu Dawood and which is Sahih, where he says, Law kana dinu bi ra'yi la kana asfal al khuffi awla bil mashi min al ala. This wording is the wordings of Ali radiallahu an, not the wordings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is the wordings of Ali radiallahu an. He says, 
If the religion were based upon the opinions, upon the intelligent, it would be more fitting to wipe under the feet rather than on the feet. When we walk, how do we walk? Like this or like this? So where does the dust forms? On top or down? Down. Down, isn't it? So what the akal says, what our intelligence says, wipe down, isn't it? So the, this hadith says that, the hadith, the, this hadith, this, the wordings of Ali radiallahu anh says that the deen is not based on your intelligence. The deen is based on Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah. There are many people who became atheists. They'll come and say Islam says, the hadith says this, the Quran says this. It is against our intelligence. And what will be your answer? Keep your intelligence with you. We believe in Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Without any fraction of doubt. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب في هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب لا ريب and بالغيب no doubt and we believe in unseen and we believe in whatever Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم says us without a fraction of doubt fraction of doubt that's our belief and if the deen is based on our akal we will we would be destroyed like those who destroyed themselves by using their intelligence and later he, ali radiyallahu anhu says wa qad ra'aytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yamsahu ala ba'ri khuffayhi then i saw rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making masah on the khuff on the socks akhraja abu dawood bi isnad sahih this hadith is a radd ala al shi'a this hadith is a radd ala al mantaqiyin those mutakallimin who uses their mind on the religion of course you can use your mind on certain aspects but those research should not cross the limits that is laid by allah and rasul am i am i, am I clear about this matter this is our iman inshallah ta'ala and we will die in this iman inshallah ta'ala so this hadith demonstrate that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did masah on the khuf when it comes to masah how are we going to do masah are we going to wash <coughs> the feet and the legs sorry are we going to wash the face hands three times are we going to do masah three times are we going to do masah one time it's once not three times <coughs> and how are we going to do masah on the feet from the toe to the ankle or just little enough little is enough as long as you wipe on it it's enough you don't have to wet it you just have to wipe it these are the ways of doing masah. <coughs> Till ankle, no. <coughs> Not necessary. Just wipe on it. This is the way of doing masah. Subhanallah. And why this masah? Can anybody tell me? As I told you in the beginning, it is a rukhas from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a concession. We hear people that, for example, we are wearing socks now. And you want to make wudu. And can you make masah on it or not? Of course you can make do masah on it. Some people will come and say that why don't you remove the socks and do wudu when the water is available. When the water is zakalakhir. When the water is available. But we say Allah and Rasul made this legislation and we follow it and we follow the rukhas. And there is absolutely no problem in it. And those who say that you have to wash, they are going against the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are people like this. There are people like this who will come and say, why are you doing masah? Why don't you wash your feet? I say, I wore my socks on tahara. I can make masah on it. And what is wrong in that? They say, no, no, no it is only a concession. Why do you want to take concession when, when you know, when you have, we can do afdal? Where is afdal word mentioned here? It is allowed that, it is allowed this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nabi, best of the NBA, best of the human on the face of the earth, whom Allah praised if two things are provided to him, difficult and ease, what would he choose? Ease. And who are you to make difficult things upon people? Take the ease. And this hadith talks about doing masa on the feet. And we all know the rules and regulations of it, inshallah. Going on to hadith number 56. 
وعن سفان بن عسال رضي الله تعالى عنه قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يأمرنا إذا كنا سفرا ألا ننزع خفافنا ثلاثة أيام ولياليهن إلا من جنابة ولكن من غأية وبول ونوم أخرجه النساء وترمذي ولفظ له وابن خزيم وصحها This hadith is from the authentic hadith which is narrated in Tirmidhi and Nasa'i and Ibn Khuzayma rahimahumullah they made it sahih and this hadith is narrated by Safwan bin Asal radiyallahu an and he was with Rasul he asked he was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the safar when they were traveling when they were traveling ya'muruna kana an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya'muruna idha kunna safara alla nanzi'a khifafina thalatha ayyam wa layalihunna illa min janabatin here the word ya'muruna okay let me translate the hadith rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sahaba were in traveling and rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them not to remove the shoes not to remove the socks for the musafir three days and three nights except if he, he is in the state of janaba except if he is in the state of janaba that is what we say hadith al-akbar in the beginning walakin but min ghaitin aw bawlin wa nawmin except if you are if he has defecated means he attend the call of nature and he urinated number 2 or the sleep or the sleep these three things will break the wudu will break the wudu and these things inshallah in detail we will be discussing in the chapter the next chapter very interesting chapter and very important chapter which nullifies the wudu the chapter number 6 there we will deal these things in detail so what you have to remember is when you are in the state of hadith al akbar you have to make ghusl you can't make massage on the socks until you purify yourself and you wear you wear socks except except for hadith al akbar what are those sleeping defecating or urinating this is the hadith here let me ask you a question ya'muruna the word ya'muruna means what is it ordered us rasulullah sallallahu alaihi ordered us is this an absolute order or is it something mustahab i have a question for you if you huh? how do you say it is mustahab order how do you say it is order it is because it is ya'muru na amara ya'muru means he ordered an amartum i am ordering you isn't it so this word is order by fail if you understand the arabic language it's an order so here what is the meaning of ya'muruna does it mean rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has ordered you not to remove the socks so for example if you're traveling that if you take the hadith as it is then you should not remove the socks or it is better not to remove and you can make masa what is the ruling exactly so there are certain words which are used in the hadith on the quran it doesn't mean that it is an order or it is an absolute prohibition for example uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran wa idha halaltum fasta'adu and once you remove your ihram once you remove your ihram then go for hunting so for example you go for hajj or umrah it is not allowed for you to hunt what Allah says fasta'adu is an amr it's an order so is it like you know you remove ihram it is order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he ordered us to go for hunting So you're going for hunting? It's an absolute word. It says that in an amr order, right? So how are you going to take it? So we understand from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that you can, and it is highly recommended, and you can do it. But it's not. It's not an order. It's not an order from Allah subhanahu wa taala. So the wordings you should not go with the explicit meaning of the wordings, but rather we need to see. how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam behaved on this hadith and how the sahaba radiyallahu anhum behaved on this kind of hadith am i clear so here it means mustahab do not remove your socks if you are a musafir and what are the timings of the musafir and one of the conditions is waqtun muhaddada the particular timings for the musafir it is 3 days and 3 nights if he is a musafir and this hadith does not talk about uh, it's it's only talk about musafir the next hadith talks about the muqim 3 days and 3 nights for example 
how how when the the time starts for for the masah for example uh, morning today morning you wore socks at 6 o'clock okay so the time starts or with the with the breaking of the wudu or with the masah this is one of the opinions of the scholars but majority of the scholars they say for example you wore socks at 6 o'clock you broke wudu at 7 o'clock and you you made wudu at 8 o'clock when you made wudu at 8 o'clock and you made masah that's when the time starts so from that 8 o'clock till 3 days and 3 nights you are valid you are allowed to make masah how many number of times n number of times how many number of times you want to make am i clear am i clear it is not the timings when you may wear, may wear socks it is when you make wipe the socks wipe the socks wipe your feet that's when the timing starts for example 6 o'clock you made, you made wudu and you wore the socks you broke the wudu at 10 o'clock you made masa at 12 o'clock so when the time starts 12 o'clock am i clear about this matter so 12 o'clock to next 3 days and 3 nights that's that's where you are valid to make masa on the socks am i clear tayyib inshallah we'll go on to the hadith number one of the reasons why one of the reasons why um, uh, we make masa on the socks is that there is something called qaida in the in the faqiya that is al mashaqqatu tajlibu taysir al mashaqqatu tajlibu taysir how do you translate this al mashaqqatu tajlibu taysir the difficulty leads to something easiness isn't it it is very difficult for example if you are traveling to remove socks every time to wear socks every time to remove for example if you are uh, traveling and there is a basin you go to the washroom there are non muslims standing there are muslims standing there they all washing suddenly what you do is you remove the socks and you put the feet there remove the socks and you put the feet there how does it look it's fine in the sight of allah subhanahu wa taala but how does it look for them it's like what is he doing i am washing my hands he put his feet there so allah subhanahu wa taala has made concession here for us this to avoid the mashaqqa for example if you're traveling in the train for example and we know our trains are very clean isn't it so if you have to remove the socks wear it it's going to dirty more so just make masa on it so this are all something rugas a concession from allah subhanahu wa taala easy for us that is why we say al mashaqqatu tajlibu taysir and this is from the mercy of allah subhanahu wa taala allah subhanahu wa taala says in the quran wa ma ja'ala alaykum fi ad-din haraj and we have not made this religion as a difficult for you yuridu allah bikum al yuridu allah bikum an yusra wa la yuridu bikum al usr allah does not want difficult for you allah wants easy for you when allah wants easy for us who are you to make difficult subhanallah this is what we i have to understand that islam the religion of islam is easy not difficult <coughs> going on to the hadith we will finish the chapter today inshallah taala it's will the few hadith left wa an ali radiyallahu taala anhu qal hadith number 57 wa an and this hadith is also from ali radiyallahu an raddu ala shia refuting of the shia wa an ali radiyallahu taala anhu qal ja'ala an nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalatha ayyam thalatha ayyam wa la yala wa la yali hunna lil musafir ويوما وليله للمقيم يعني في المسح على الخفين اخرجه مسلم this hadith is also narrated by ali radiyallahu anhu and which is recorded in musahi muslim which says about the masah the validation the timings of a person who is a muqim who is a muqim who is not a traveler when we say traveler when we say muqim i would like to tell you that to be more specific the people are divided into three categories Number one, mustautin. What is the meaning of mustautin? Mustautin is the one who belongs to that particular land. We are Indians, and nobody take, can take our Indian citizenship from. We are Indians, and we are mustautin here. And you travel to a different country for a work, education, or something, and you stay for a long time. You are a mukim, not a mustautin. But you are staying, you are working there, for example. when you will become musafir is you doing for going to some place to visit or some that's when you become musafir 
So when you say Muqim and Mustawdin, the ruling for Muqim and Mustawdin is the same ruling. But the Musafir is a different ruling. Three days and three nights. For the Muqim it is one day and one night. And the timing is also the same. When the Masah starts from that time to till the next day, you can make Masah on the socks. And this hadith explains about that. And who narrated this hadith? Ali radiallahu an. And Raddu alal Shia ithna Sharia. Hadith number 58. Wa'an Thawbana radiallahu ta'ala anhu qal. بعث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم سرية فأمرهم أن يمسحوا على الأصائب يعني الأمائم وتساخين يعني الخفاف رواه أحمد وأبو داود وصحه الحاكم This hadith This hadith is narrated by Thawban رضي الله عنه which says that they went out they sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a group of Muslims for Sariya. What is Sariya? Exactly. There is a difference between Sariya and there is a difference between Ghazwa. Ghazwa is where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in the war. Sariya is, he did not participate in that, but it is not Sariya. That's the difference between both of it. So he sent, sent some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. فَأَمَرَهُمْ أَيَمْسَهُ عَلَى الْحَصَائِبَ And he ordered... <coughs> And he also amarahum here. That is mustahab, not the absolute order. Al al asaib, asaib is amama, means amama, imama, <coughs> and also tasahin, yani khifaf. Tasahin means khifaf. This hadith says that it is allowed to do masa on the socks as well as amaim, which is amama. And there is a difference between amama. There are different. For example, the thing which I am wearing is not considered as imama okay and for example there are if you go to Egypt there are some people who wear turban isn't it the turban is just you know it's on the head you can remove it and you can wear it and you're not supposed to make a masa on the on those turban as well what are the turbans that you can make masa on those turban if you go to some of the African countries and Sudan like that you will find some of them wearing it it's like tied on the head and there is a tail which comes back and that goes under the neck and which is tied again which is tied again it is allowed to make masah on the on that head why it is allowed because al mashakkatu tajlibu taisir because of the difficulty in removing it tying it and that also you know it's a waste of time it's a waste of time so to protect our timings to have barakah on our timings allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has made easy for us this hadith explains about the mashakka. This hadith also, with this hadith, there are some other hadith and the opinion of the ulama that you know, not only am I, even the woman can do masa on the khimar, on the khimar, on the scarf. If they find very difficult to remove, if they are in the public place when they are making wudu. If you go to haram, you know, there are some certain places where you can make wudu and it's you no know, men and women are walking around and it's very difficult to uncover. So it is allowed to make masa on their khimar. Mashakka, tajlibu. It is allowed, inshaAllah. Going on to the hadith number 59, وعن عمر رضي الله تعالى أنه مرفوعا موقوفا وأنس مرفوعا إذا توضع أحدكم فلبس خفيه فليل فليمسح عليهم فأنس فين فليمسح عليهما فليصلي فيهما ولا يخلهما إن شاء الله إلا من جنابة أخرجه دار كوتني والحاكم وصحها. This hadith is narrated by two people, two sahaba radiallahu anhu. One is Amr radiallahu anhu and that is mentioned mawkufan. When we say mawkuf, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of mawkuf? Exactly. When we say mawkuf, wahuwa ma kana min kalami sahaba. What it is, which is from the words of sahaba radiallahu anhu. Ma kana min Kalami Sahaba and Anas in Marfu and means which is attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Marfu, we hear, hear this kind of words many times Marfu, Mawko, Mursil. Don't worry, as in when we go through, inshallah, we will talk about some of the uh, technical meaning of the hadith also, inshallah. Okay, so Marfu, what does it mean? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ida tawabda ahadukum, if one of you make wudu, falab. And if he wears the khuf on the tahara, 
any khuf which covers the ankle but hanafiya they differ on this opinion they say that no it is only allowed on the leather socks not on the socks that normally which we wear but there is a hadith uh, there is a hadith uh, in sahih muslim and abu dawood where it is mentioned that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did masah on the socks and the shoe on the socks and the shoes which is not khuf on the socks and the shoes and this hadith is also narrated by abdullah bin mas'ud sahal bin sa'ad radiyallahu an amr ibn al-as radiyallahu an and uh, uh, many other sahaba radiyallahu anhum so which shows that it is allowed to make masa on the jawrab on the on the socks this is the dalil alhamdulillah so hanafiya they differ it but alhamdulillah what is sahih is it is allowed to make uh wiping on this if you go to some of the anifi masajids here and if you start wiping on the socks they'll say your wudu is invalid but what is sahih is it is absolutely valid inshallah ta'ala and you can pray in it you can pray in it there are couple of opinions in this matter not in this matter for example you made wudu you made masa on the socks then you removed it then you removed it okay so are you still in the state of wudu or not is the question Hmm? No, the question is, the question is, you made wudu, and you did you did masa on the socks. After some time, you removed the socks. You removed the socks. Are you in the state of wudu or not? Exactly. Exactly. This is one of the opinions of the scholars. This is the one of the opinions of the scholars. But majority of the scholars says you are in the state of wudu because that masa is badal. The masa is something concession. So you are state in the wudu, in the state of wudu. Now question arises: You remove the socks. You remove the socks. Then again you wore the socks without making wudu. Can you make masa on it? You got my question? You made wudu, remove the socks. You made wudu, remove the socks. You made the sorry, you made wudu. You wore socks, okay? Then remove the socks. Again, you wore the socks. Can you do masa on it? No, you're not allowed to make it because you didn't wear it in the state of tahara. Even if you're in the state of tahara, because again you have to make wudu on it. Again, you have to make wudu on it. A new wudu on it. it's after wiping you have removed you're in the state of wudu but if you want to make masa on it again after wearing it again for that you have to make wudu again am i clear about this matter exactly exactly you understand right that's a condition inshallah <coughs> we'll go on to the hadith number 60 is it confusing sir for example we are making wudu yeah This question we will take at the end, inshallah. So that it will be we'll, two hadiths are there. We'll explain it and we'll take the questions at the end, inshallah. If there are any questions from the uh, lady side, you can bring it, inshallah. <coughs> we'll go on to the hadith number sixty. Wa an Abi Bakr radiyallahu taala an anhu an the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam anhu rakhsa lil musafir thalatha ayam wa la yali hunna wa lil mukaim wa lil mukim yom wa leila. إذا تطهر فلبس خفيه أن يمسح عليه ما أخرجه دار قطني وسح ابن خزيمة. Again ابن حجر أسكلان رحمه الله brought this hadith which talks about the validation of the period of the musafir for making wudu for making masa and also for the making making masa. Why did he bring this hadith again when we already know already know the ruling? Because 
it is to make so make it certain to make it certain the rulings are made to make ruling certain for example the knowledge when we gain knowledge we need to be certain about it if somebody comes and tells you no this is not correct and that is not correct when we, you will say no i know the ruling of it and you will not be confused about the ruling that's when you are certain about the matter certain about the ruling so that's why that's when that's why imam ibn hajar from his methodology is to bring the hadith and he repeats the hadith again and again sometimes from the different narrations from the different narrators to make it more certain and we are going to the last and final hadith of this chapter of this uh, chapter inshallah tell us hadith number 61 wa an abi wa wa an ubay ibn ibn imarah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu annahu qala ya rasulullah امسح على الخفين قال نعم قال يوما قال نعم قال يومين قال نعم قال ثلاثة وثلاثة أيام قال نعم وما شئت أخرجه أبو دعود وقال ليس بالقوي this hadith is narrated by Ubay ibn Imara this hadith is da'if this hadith is da'if is very weak what is the meaning of this hadith one of the sahabi asked ya rasulullah امسح على الخفين can I make مساء عن الخفين he said yes قال يوما he said نعم one day he said yes قال يومين he said yes قال ثلاثة أيام he said yes three days okay and further Rasulullah further Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم explained that قال نعم وما شئت قال نعم وما شئت and he said as long as you want and this particular ruling is going against the ruling of three days and three nights and one day and one night isn't it so this hadith is ضعيف this hadith is daif we do not take this hadith because you know when we talk about a hadith there are hadiths which are daif there are hadiths which are sahih sometimes hadiths which are isnad isnad of daif sometimes hadiths are which are by matan daif so how are we going to make it sahih is by the other hadiths which are related to that particular topic that particular topic and we as a student of knowledge we need to understand uh, the daif hadiths also maudu ahadith as well as sahih ahadith we should be able to differentiate abdullah rahimahullah the son of imam ahmed ibn hanbal rahimahullah he asked his son to memorize 15000 ahadith he memorized all 15000 ahadith after memorizing 15000 ahadith he told him all these hadith are maudu or daif then he started, he asked him to memorize sahih hadith so he was able to differentiate between sahih hadith and maudu ahadith now Hudayfa radiyallahu an we know that Hudayfa one of the sahabi jalil he asked rasul everybody asks about good good about rasul you know good in the deen and i used to ask what are the sharr isn't it he used to ask about the bad things so he should be able to differentiate between good and bad between khair and sharr so we need to as a student of knowledge we should know what is bad and we should also know what is good so these are the conditions and these are the things that we have studied uh, when it comes to the chapter mas'al al khufain as i told you socks any socks can be worn and there is a difference of opinion among the scholars when it comes to the socks which is very thin when it comes to the socks which is very thin socks which you know shows the skin but imam ibn taymi rahimahullah and others ulama rahimahumullah they say that as long as it's covering can be utilized but what is better to be in a safe society is to wear a proper socks inshallah taala another question arises you know uh, can we wear socks which has holes can we make masa on it if there are small holes absolutely no problem because sahaba radiyallahu anhum they were poor and ibn taym rahimahullah and other scholars they say that it is impossible that their hoof is without holes their hoofs are without holes and as long as what is socks if it is small small holes no problem and if it is ripped apart half or quarter then that is not socks that is not socks you can't make masa on it if there are holes here and there absolutely uh, it is allowed to make masa on it so with this we straight we finish the chapter babu mashi ala al khufain and next chapter is babu nawaqid al wudu chapter 6 a very important chapter you know many people are confused about this you know what makes the wudu invalid what makes the wudu valid what makes the wudu breaks what makes uh, what what are the things that makes uh, you know breaks the wudu on all in the next chapter it's very interesting and it's very important inshallah taala 
if there are any questions we will take the questions otherwise we will wind the session barakallahu feekum yes a shoes no or it should be on the socks it should be on the socks no the no the hadith sahih the hadith of uh, where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did on the hoof and on the shoes and the shoes is not those shoes which i didn't i think we not many we wear nowadays but what is the condition is shoes jawrab jawrab we say jawrab it is similar to socks yeah any questions uh, any questions from that side from the female side Uh, if it is of small small sizes small small not a problem inshallah it should look like a socks there is some ulama have mentioned about the coin size they mentioned but it is allowed in that on that as well on that as well but when uh, we wear it and it is considered as socks if it is torn quarter of it and less than quarter of it and half of it that's when we say it is not a socks and it is not allowed to do massa on it Yes, yes. Completely wet. Then I have to change the socks. Okay, okay. Um, masa will be there. You are in the state of masa. You will be state in the masa. You are state in the wudu. Yes, you can make masa on it also. Not a problem. Yes, you can make. Or if you want to remove and wash your feet, absolutely no problem. Both are allowed. completely wet yes no masa does not retain yeah new wudu and as if new that is this. for example uh, you made wudu you wore, mas- uh, wore socks now after complete wudu huh? you wore socks now then after some time what you did this is the feet for example and you removed half of the feet half socks from the feet for the next wudu you can't make masa on it for the next feet for the next uh, wudu you can't make masa on it rather you have to remove completely make wudu completely then wear socks and for the next wudu you have to make masa on it that answered your question now you that you can't make masa the validity is once you remove finish i think that's answered now isn't it yeah we not barakallahu feekum tanuk socks tanuk socks wudu remains but masa wudu remains for the masa it is not valid for that you have to make a new wudu and will uh, take the questions from the sister side uh, shake if i wore socks in the state of wudu and remove it for some times but i am still in wudu and then again wear socks in the same wudu can i do masa uh, uh, later on no that's what we discussed right now once you wear um, uh, socks after the wudu then if you remove it then again you wear the socks you can't do masa on it rather you have to make new wudu for it second question uh, is is it is it must for women to wear socks while offering salah very good question is it must to wear socks while offering salah very good question this is important topic very lengthy thing and subhanallah it is not the question is is it important for the woman to wear socks while making while offering salah Alama they say some of the alama they say you need to cover your feet because feet is from the aura of the woman so now the alama have explained on this matter that wearing the socks wearing the socks they say it reveals the figure of the feet the shape of the feet so where is the shape now where is the aura now which is which is revealed in that case there is nothing called where you have to cover it but what is afdal is to wear the hijab which is long and you don't have to cover your feet i'm i'm making it very brief and this particular topic inshallah we will discuss more in detail when it comes to the clothing in babu sala in clothing we will discuss in detail 
so it is not obligatory to cover but some of the ulama has made it obligatory to cover the feet but Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah and others call they say it is not obligatory especially when you're praying at home you must have seen some of the people you know when you go to their houses the woman before the offering salah they wear socks and they offer salah it is absolutely not necessary they are in their homes they are in their homes absolutely no problem in covering it am I clear about this inshallah Fai. the another question is is it obligatory to cover our feet while praying just now I answered that question Another, I make wudu, then I wear socks. Now, is it is it that I have to make a masa on it? I make wudu, then I wear socks. I make wudu and I wear socks. Now, is it that I have to make masa on it? Yes. If you want to make masa, you can make masa. If you want to remove it, and while making another wudu, if you want to wash your feet, you can fish. Either way, it is fine. But take the rukhas, which Allah has made easy for us, inshallah. Hope it has answered all the questions. Barakallah. If there are any questions here, we'll take it. Say, for example, now in the morning we are getting ready for office. So I have no intention that I will wipe over my socks. So just I made wudu, I dressed up and I wore uh, socks. And I went to office. After like the word I came and I remember that when I uh, wore my socks, it was my, I was in state of wudu. So I just, uh, I can wipe over it. Yeah, yeah. The question so is, intention required for that. Mm, the question here is, I'll repeat the question so it's been live telecast and recorded. So the question here is, uh, he made wudu and he wore, wore, wore socks and he didn't intend to make masa for the next wudu. So can I make masa or not? Absolutely no problem, you can make masa on it inshallah. Intention is not required for it. Yeah, it's there for wudu, yes, absolutely. It's already included in that, absolutely perfect. Anything else? Yes. Can you repeat the question, please? I'm not going to get up. Huh? But I wore the socks. Hmm. I told you, put the socks in When you wore socks, when you wore, the question is, uh, you were not in the state of wudu, but you were wearing socks. When you went to the masjid, can you make masa on it or not? My question to you is, when you wore that socks, were you in tahara or not? Were you in the state of wudu or not? You were still in the state of wudu. Yes, you can make, inshallah. And if you wore the socks not in the state of wudu, then you can't make masa on it. Am I clear about this? Yes. Any questions? Otherwise, we'll wind up, inshallah. We'll wind up. Jazakumullah. Next class, inshallah, Babu Nawakidul Wudu. Very important chapter. We will see you on next Sunday. Mubarakallahu feekum wa jazakumullahu khairan. Can you explain the conditions of a traveler? When a person can be considered a traveler? What are the conditions? Uh, the, he, the, he asked the conditions of traveler. It's a lengthy topic. But I can brief you up. The traveler, the moment he leaves home to a certain distance, to a certain area, for example, you're going to a different city, for example, you, then you are considered as a traveler. And the ulama have got more than 20 to 25 opinions on this matter. And Ibn Hajar Askalan, uh, Ibn Hajar Askalan has written in his Fatulibari about this, all these opinions. Some of the opinions are like, you know, one meal is a traveler. One meal is a traveler. The moment you ho leave the home is a traveler. 84 kilometers is a traveler. One day and one night is a traveler. 50 kilometers is a traveler. You know, different opinions. But what is Sahih is, there is a distance for that. Distance is not 84 kilometers. The distance is timings. And during Dhamma Fahaba radiallahu anhu, 84 kilometers means it is like one day and one night or two days and two nights traveling. If it is that case. For example, Tumkur here. We have Tumkur. Okay, you going for work there, you are coming back again, you are not supposed to, you are not considered as traveler, neither you have to shorten the prayers there, you will come back again, back here. In Makkah, we used to go to Jeddah, in Makkah, we used to go to Jeddah, we are not supposed to shorten the prayer or we are not, we are not considered as Musafir, but we go to Taif, we are considered as Musafir, the distance matters here. You understand? I'm just briefing it up. This particular thing, inshallah, we will discuss in chapter, you know, uh, Salatul Musafir. Inshallah. Barakallahu alaikum. Will you end up the session, inshallah? Wa jazakumullah khairan wa barakallahu alaikum wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.